Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you uh, for joining us. I'm delighted uh, to have uh, the President of Chile, Sebastian Pinera, as one of the co-chairs of the World Economic Forum's Sustainable Development Impact Summit here uh, this year. President Pinera, as uh, you know, uh, is the 36th President of Chile serving his second non-consecutive term. He was also the president uh, of Chile from 2010 to 2014, having also achieved a very successful business path. As such, he is one of the leaders who are most capable of embodying the forum's ethos of public-private cooperation. Chile has been one of the most successful countries in advancing towards the achievement of uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. The Chilean public-private strategy offers an interesting and innovative model that we would like to learn more about. And as you all know, uh, President Pinera will be hosting uh, COP25 on the climate next December. In this context, I can say, with confidence that we have a clear compatibility in our vision and in the commitments we have undertaken to improve the state of the world. I have no doubt that your leadership, Mr. President, will be instrumental as we advance this year, and it is our honor uh, to have you, Mr. President, with us today. The floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you very much, board. Well, it's true. We are, we are going to be hosting the next COP25 meeting in Santiago, and probably it's the last chance that we have to change the course of the world in this respect. Each generation has its own challenge, but I'm convinced that no generation has faced such an urgent and formidable challenge as we are facing now with respect to climate change and global warming. I think that this is really the battle of our lifetime. The human being is the smartest creature that lives in this planet. And at the same time, it's the only creature which is capable, and sometimes I think willing, to destroy our planet. And that's something that, of course, we cannot accept. That's why I think that the time for action has come. Political leadership is about doing what is good, what is right, for your people, for your country, for the world. Even when you are facing, or, or when your mission is unpopular, or, we, or when you are facing great difficulties. Today we are facing great difficulties. We have a problem with the weakened international economy, a trade or tariff war between the two superpowers, and many other problems. But I am absolutely convinced that this is something that we have to unite us, to face and to confront together how to deal with this climate change which is coming close in, closer to a climate crisis. These difficulties cannot prevent us from acting together to force and to face these uh, huge challenges that I was mentioning before. Leadership is also about balancing the competing interests of different groups. In this case, all those interests come together because it's a question of survival. I read some times ago many magazines publishing a picture of the planet Earth with the legend saying, let's save planet Earth. I think that they are wrong. It's not planet Earth which is at risk. Planet Earth has lived more than 4,300 million years and has faced and survived all kinds of catastrophes. What is really at risk is the survival of the human race in our planet. That's why I'm absolutely convinced that we have to take action. And I'm concerned about the results of the last scientific uh, report that is telling us that the situation is much worse than what we thought, and, and it is worse and faster than what we thought. For instance, science, United for Science, will come out with a report this week saying that the last five years has been the hottest 
five years in the history, in the known history of mankind, that the level of ocean is still rising, that the level of our emission of carbon is still rising, and that we are going in the wrong direction. I think that in front of that challenge, you have two options. One, to wait and see and face the consequence. That's not the right option. The right option is that we need to act now, face the challenge, and try to change history while we still can do it. I think and I'm very happy because what I've seen and heard during these days in, in, in New York is that the, the community and also the government have realized the huge responsibility that we have to do what has to be done and should have been done long before. So there's a change of attitude. There's a change of compromise. For instance, uh, the Secretary General of the, of the United Nations asked us to organize what he called a coalition for ambition. We have been able in a few weeks to commit 66 countries, uh, one out of every three, to uh, become carbon neutral before 2050. One of them is Chile. Chile is already moving in that direction, basically with four tools. First of all, we are decarbonizing 100% of our energy matrix. Second, we are changing the fuel of our public transportation system from fossil fuels to electricity. Third, we are, standing, we are establishing very high standards of uh, energy efficiency in all sectors, and we are undertaking a huge effort to increase the forestation and to increase the level and the quantity of our forests. With those four main reasons, we, uh, main instrument, we will be able to achieve, hopefully before 2050. A few weeks ago, in Osaka, in the G20 meeting, six countries started with this commitment. Spain, Italy, France, Germany, the UK, and Chile. Now we have 66 countries. And not only that, more than 100 cities, more than 100 big enterprises have also uh, achieved this commitment of becoming carbon neutral. For doing that is something that is absolutely needed. Chile is one Chile was one of the first countries in the world to ban plastic bags. A plastic bag takes less than one second to be produced. It is used on average not more than 15 minutes. And it takes 400 years to biodegrade. Four year, 400 years contaminating our oceans and our land. Actually, if we project the course that we are following now, very soon there will be more plastic bags than fish in our oceans. And that's another tendency that we need to change. To protect the environment and the biodiversity of our planet Earth is not only an environmental commitment, it's a moral commitment. It's something that we do. We owe it to our son, to our children, to grandchildren, and the, and the generation that will come. Because they also have the right to live in this planet Earth. We are the first generation to suffer the consequences of climate change and global warming, and the last one that can do something to avoid a tragedy. And that's a huge responsibility. But I, I'm, I'm optimistic, because we have just participated or organized a, a summit to protect the rainforest, another one to protect the ocean, and the last one, which was called by the Secretary General of the United Nations, was in terms of uh, climate change. And I see a huge change in attitude. We know too much to remain skeptical about what is happening with our climate and what is happening with the global warming. We have no right to just be, be, remain skeptical, wait and see what will happen. We have a duty, a moral duty to act, and I think that the whole world is understanding that. I would like to thank the young people that are pushing us to go faster, to go further, because that's something absolutely necessary. The message has been received, and we are taking action. And I hope that in the COP that we will celebrate in Chile by December of this year, we will make big, significant progress in order to change the course of history and avoid the strategy and control our, our climate and stop our global warming. The time is now. The time for action is now. Let's move. Thank you very much.
Thank you, uh, Mr. President, uh, for that uh, inspiring uh, speech and also uh, for Chile's uh, commitment uh, both to the rainforest, uh, to uh, the ocean, and also when it comes to climate change. We um, know that uh, there is a lot of responsibility also related to hosting uh, this COP25 uh, on climate. We know um, we uh, also uh, have uh, some countries that are moving faster than others. As you mentioned uh, yourself, uh, Mr. President, there are countries that have committed to be carbon neutral, and there are countries that are not committed um, in the foreseeable future to be uh, carbon neutral. But looking at uh, prospects now in the run-up to COP25, uh, what, what do you think is achievable, and how are you going to push and nudge uh, those that are uh, not in the forefront and, and how to make a uh, consensus around uh, maybe uh, the most important uh, question that we are uh, faced with uh, as human uh, kind. I think also as, as a former very successful businessman, um, you are used to looking at cost. I think one of the challenges is that we look at the cost of implementation of action, but what we really should know uh, look at is the cost of inaction when it comes to climate, and I think that's a higher cost than the cost of action. Well, the cost of inaction is infinite, because all the science and the scientists are telling us that if we don't change, and we have only one decade to do the major changes, the system will collapse. For instance, we will, we will know the results of this uh, science for action that will tell us that, as I was telling you before, that the last five years have been the hottest five years in the history of mankind. We have the highest concentration of, uh, uh, of gases and, 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 and carbon and greenhouse gases in the history of mankind. And the, same, and the same thing is happening with the acidity and the oxygenation of our oceans. Our poles are melting. The, sea level is rising, all those things are not only happening, they are speeding up. One thing that we have to realize is that, uh, that the problem is much more serious than what the scientists expected, and it's worsening much rapidly than what they projected. Therefore, what are we expecting to achieve in the COP25 in Chile? Basically, that countries will come with mu much more ambitious and forceful commitments in terms of reducing a greenhouse gases emission. Second, we need to put into act and to involve the private sector. And for that, to be able to put into action Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, which it is uh, about uh, carbon bonds and carbon markets, is absolutely necessary. Because that's a way to, not only to speed up the process, but also to improve the efficiency of the process of reducing greenhouse house gases emissions. Third, we want to introduce into the COP25 the concern and the uh, obligation to protect and conserve our rainforest, our oceans, and our poles. And that's something new that has never been considered in the previous COP. Today we were meeting with the key countries that will make the difference. The biggest country and the, and the, and the most vulnerable country in the United Nations. And I seen a change, a dramatic and, and very positive change of attitude. So we're confident that what was considered impossible, remember that the COP in Poland didn't reach major results. It was not a success. At the same time, we have many other problems I would like to face. Chile will host the APEC meeting in November, and there we have other issues that we have to be to address. This harmful and absurd tariff war between the two superpowers it has to end. I would like to say, Mr. Jinping, Mr. Trump, end this uh, harmful and, and uh, absurd war. We have to fortify the international institution, like the World Trade Organization, which is not working, in order to avoid that each country is taking their own me measures in, form, in a unilateral, unilateral way which is not the way to really act in a smart way.
So there are so many challenges that we have to face. That one thing that I realized, when we more need, because now we have all the science, all the technology, all the knowledge, like never before. What we need is leadership. And it's really amazing and incredible that the two most powerful countries in the world, instead of being leading all these big challenges that we have to face, are involved in a stupid tariff war. Talking about um, uh, trade and, and trade wars, I, I wrote an article uh, some months ago saying that uh, trade is not a weapon. Uh, a trade is really about bringing a prosperity and eradicating poverty. And I think Chile is a good example of a country that has a very open economy, has uh, er eradicated a lot of poverty, and probably there's no other country in the world with so many bilateral trade agreements, but at the same time, you're so supportive of the multilateral system with uh, WTO. So I think your APEC meeting in that respect will be very important. Do you expect some br trade breakthroughs there too that you can share with us here in confidence? Well, I, I participated in the Papua Guinea last APEC meeting. It was a complete failure. And uh, again, of course, we have to, to change that. Chile was the poorest Spanish colony in America. And it has become the most developed and with the highest per capita income country in Latin America, based on good institutions and a very open, competitive, and transparent economy. We have free trade agreement with almost every country in the world. The US, Europe, China, uh, India, you name it. More than 80% of the PIF has free trade agreement with, with Chile, and that's something which has worked to our benefit. But it also works for the benefit of the other countries. International trade is good for everybody. When we engage in these protectionist practices, we all suffer. Because, uh, and remember, the, the, the world was very open until the, un, uh, until the First World War. Was with the big crisis when we reacted by protecting our markets, as if we could protect our markets. We cannot protect all of our markets. If that was possible, I would, I would be a fan of that. You, at the most, you can protect one sector at the cost of, of desprotecting many other sectors. And when the other country retaliates, doing exactly the same, the situation gets much worse. So I think that free trade, fair trade, is absolutely necessary. Now we need to introduce e-commerce and electronic trade and so many things. And for that, we need to fortify and modernize the World Trade Organization, which is not playing any role. It's not playing any role. First of all, the, the panel of arbitration is not working because the people that have to be appointed have not been appointed because some countries are is, uh, blocking that. So I, that's one thing which is very important. In terms of poverty, we made a strong commitment. Let me tell you something. Latin America is a very lucky continent. We have had it all. Vast territories, generous natural resources. We didn't have the kind of war that almost destroyed Europe last century. We don't have the kind of uh, religious conflict that are so harmful in so many areas of the world. And still, it's an underdeveloped con uh, continent with almost one third of its population living in poverty. That's not a God will or, a, or, or, or something related to destiny. It's simply because we have not been able to take advantage of the opportunity. And now we have a new opportunity because the society of knowledge and information has proved to be extremely generous with those countries that want to face it and embrace it and extremely cruel with those countries that just look uh, somewhere else and let it pass. So I think that uh, Latin America has now a new opportunity to take advantage of all the good things that we have in Latin America. And for that, we need to do and undertake huge reforms. So we have to improve the quality of education in a Copernican way. We have to invest much more in science and technology and research. We have to be much more inclusive in terms of incorporating everybody to the effort and to the benefits of development. We have to also to uh, be much more friendly with entrepreneurship and innovation. The state many times intends, instead of helping them, it really uh, does exactly the opposite. So there are many challenges in Latin America. Chile has decided to 
be the first Latin American country to defeat poverty and to uh, reach development before the end of this next decade. That's our mission, that's our target, that's why we're working for. And uh, Mr. President, this also fits uh, very well with the overarching target of uh, the Sustainable Development Goals 17, when the overarching one is uh, eradicating all extreme uh, poverty. I just wanted to pick up on one thing you mentioned uh, in your speech, you also addressed the situation with the rainforest. And I think um, there has been concerns uh, related to this. I think there was a meeting uh, this morning also among uh, some Latin American uh, presidents. Um, any insight on this that you would like to share with us? Well, the See, rain was a diplomatic yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> Well, very diplomatic. The you hope for a candid answer. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You'll get it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, rainforests are key for the health of our planet and for the quality of life of our people. They attract almost one third of all the greenhouse gases emission that we make. And also they are very powerful producers of oxygen, and they regulate temperature, and they regulate the flows of water. There are many things that they can do for us. And besides, they have a huge and magnificent biodiversity. And unfortunately, because of forest fires and deforestation, we're destroying too much of our rainforest, which are in the Amazonian zone, in the Congo Basin, also in, in the... In, in, Southeast Asia. Also in Chile, we have a very significant rainforest. They are not tropical rainforests, but they are rainforests in the, what we call the El Bosque Valdiviano. So uh, what we're doing with our forest, rainforest is something really incredible. That's why when we were meeting in the G7, when we were at the G7 meeting in Biarritz, uh, and, 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 and many, many rainforests were on fire, literally on fire, there was a, a movement to come out with help. And what we're doing now, and we have this conference, which was headed by President Macron and President Duque and myself, basically to improve our quality to protect and conserve our rainforest and its magnificent biodiversity. And the four principles. First of all, we need to protect and conserve our rainforest in a much better way than what we're doing. Second, for that, we need also to allow for sustainable use of all of those natural resources because many people live on that. Third, we need international help and collaboration. And fourth, that sovereignty must be respected. Those are the four principles that will allow a big alliance from countries where those rainforests are and those countries that want to protect those rainforests because they realize that they don't only impact the countries where they are, but they impact, they impact the whole world. And that's something we make a huge progress today in that respect. And therefore, we are happy because I, what I feel is after so many times of discussion and negotiation, people have realized that the time is over. The time for action has come. And I hope that that new attitude will be expressed, fully expressed, in commitments and actions in our uh, COP25 that will be hosted by Chile in December of this year. Thank you, Mr. President. Let's thank the President for joining us today.